In this week's news, the SOS wet dress has not really gone to plan, China's six-month space station trip has come to an end and Starbase activity has kept moving. This is tomorrow's space news. Booster 7 has completed pressure testing at an ambient temperature, which means that cryogenic propellants aren't loaded, so we can't see ice, but the tanks are pressurised. On the 13th of April, Booster 7 then performed a pneumatic test. This let off so much vapour, however, that it was actually kind of hard to see the super heavy booster at times. The following day, Booster 7 underwent another cryoproof test, but this time on the structural test stand, as it has not yet returned to the orbital launch mount. SpaceX's LR11000 crane was hooked up to Booster 7 through the load spreader and then lifted off the can crusher onto the transport stand. Two days later and the Super Heavy was rolling down the road back to the production site. We don't know if this is for Raptor editions or for other purposes as the next booster is right around the corner. Booster 8 is the next booster under construction and over the week it has slowly been growing in the high bay. Most recently its liquid oxygen tank has been stacked onto aft section 4. Ship 25's nose cone barrel has been spotted at the production site. This is the stack of five rings which goes immediately underneath the actual nose cone section. The aft section of Ship 25 has been spotted here as well. Everything below Ship 24 is now considered outdated, obsolete technology, which is why Ship 21 has now been scrapped. It's been sitting around not doing much for a while and it's finally time to see it go. We've seen two of the new flatter common domes at Starbase so far and if you are a regular viewer you'll know that the first dome was scrapped. Well, the same fate has come upon the second, which was scrapped after being cut into. We then saw a third new type of dome being placed onto the sleeving stand, so make sure to stay tuned to the channel to see what happens with this one. The sleeve for this dome has also been seen. The wide bay's final level is nearly complete as it has reached just over one prefabricated section higher than the high bay and another factory has just started construction. This will replace the tents which are currently at the production facility to make a more permanent structure for assembling Starship pieces and storing Raptor engines. To finish off the SpaceX update, a couple new bits of hardware have been recently spotted that aren't to do with Starship. This is Crew Dragon Freedom, which will be used for Crew 4 and it has just arrived at Cape Canaveral and this is Falcon Heavy Core Booster B1074. It will be expended on its flight, unlocking full potential out of the stage and it's just been spotted in testing at McGregor in Texas. Last week, SLS successfully performed its wet dress rehearsal flawlessly. It's what I would have liked to say, but that is very much not the case. Leaky hydrogen and issues that can't be fixed on the pad have not really helped the big orange rocket, which means that it's safe to say a launch in June probably not going to happen. If you are new to the wet dress rehearsal, NASA isn't providing us with any kind of countdown net feed, so we can't hear what the ground teams are saying, but we are receiving updates from the NASA Exploration Ground Systems Twitter account. Firstly, on April 14th, the tanking of SLS was delayed due to a nitrogen pipeline issue, and then the account announced that during the third attempt of the wet dress, a leak of liquid hydrogen was detected in the tail service mast umbilical, one of the pipes which hooks up SLS to the service tower. However, teams confirmed that they were satisfied with the test objectives for the second stage, aka the intermittent cryogenic propulsion stage. The third time was not the charm and it ended in another scrub. If you watched the live feed of 39B on Friday, you might have seen a few vehicles driving around as teams went to the pad to try and sort out some problems. However, in a media advisory, NASA announced that they will be taking advantage of required upgrades to an off-site supply of gaseous nitrogen, using the opportunity to roll SLS back to the VAB to replace the ICPS check valve and patch up the leak on the umbilical, which means no wet dress attempt for and another slip in the launch schedule. Because don't forget, NASA hasn't completed a full wet dress rehearsal yet, and they've tried three times and they've found problem in all three attempts. This means that NASA will have to roll SLS back out to the pad once these issues have been solved, try and wet dress, and if successful, they could go straight to a launch attempt two days later if NASA is willing to take that risk, and it's a decently sized risk at that. If not, then they'll have to roll SLS back to their VAB to clean off any smudges and sort out any other issues, and then roll the entire stack back out to the pad for a third time for a proper launch attempt. Is it August, September, or later? We don't know yet, but if it is in August, then I'll make sure to cover it alongside my Psyche coverage, which you can contribute to in the description.
The astronaut transfer van, commonly known as the Astro Van, is a very integral part of any NASA crewed mission as it's the last journey any astronaut will take on Earth before they return. We haven't actually seen a van in use recently as when SpaceX started launching crew in 2020 they opted for a fleet of Tesla Model Xs of course with Elon's links being at the top of both companies. NASA however is keeping to a van shaped vehicle for their next generation of rocket and the specific model of said van was announced last week. EV manufacturer Canoe has been chosen to provide multiple lifestyle vehicles which is the name of their first vehicle planning to launch near the end of this year. I would say that the design of this vehicle is unique and probably not in a good way but at least on the concept art they're sticking with the iconic silver with red white and blue stripes from the classic shuttle era airstream astro van it's an iconic paint job so i'm very happy to see them sticking with it i just hope it survives after the concept stage the actual shape of the vehicle is a bit Odd. It kind of looks like a supersized version of the pods you can ride in at Heathrow Airport, but it is electric, which will help NASA's reputation that they are at least offsetting some of the worst things for the atmosphere coming out the business end of the solid rocket boosters on SLS. Also, I think I'm going to settle with calling this thing a van. One, this picture, and two, it's kind of a van shape. I'll let you lot discuss that in the comments though. Earth imaging company Maxar has been publishing a lot of imagery showing Russian military troops, vehicles and other related things surrounding the invasion of Ukraine, but they've been doing this with just four satellites. Their CEO, Daniel Jablonski, has said that they don't have a lot of spare capacity for their customers, but that shouldn't be an issue with their upcoming constellation. Worldview Legion will be a group of six satellites which will expand the capacity of capturing imagery and it is critical to Maxar's future. That last part doesn't sound too great when you learn that Legion has suffered a lot of delays and other setbacks, such as the most recent delay caused by the shortage of Ukrainian Antonov aircraft which I covered last week. The first two of those six for launch are going to be trucked from their manufacturing plant in California to Cape Canaveral for the first Falcon 9 launch Maxar have ordered. Originally, the second flight was scheduled to carry the next four, but for redundancy, Maxar opted to purchase a third flight, two satellites on each. The added time is predicted to be about two weeks, moving from flying to trucking. Introducing these six new satellites soon is very important for Maxar, as it will double the area they can observe at a time, giving a lot more room for customers such as the National Reconnaissance Office and the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. The NRO are about to come up again as we head into space traffic. Firstly, let's start with a launch from China, which was Ducky 1 on a Long March 4C. Liftoff commenced at 1816 UTC on April 15th from Launch Complex 9 at the Taiyan Satellite Launch Center. This is China's first satellite dedicated to comprehensive monitoring of the atmospheric environment and it can monitor gases which are considered pollutants such as nitrogen dioxide and sulfur dioxide. This is space traffic, so we don't just cover launches, we also cover Earth arrivals, and it's China making an appearance again. Undocking from the Nadir docking port on the Tiane core module of the Tiangong Space Station at 1644 UTC on April 15th, the Shenzhou 13 spacecraft slowly made its way back down to Earth with Commander Zhai Zhigang, Operator Wang Yaping, and System Operator Yi Gang Fu wrapping up their six month stay on the station. After ditching the service and orbital modules as well as some fuel, the re-entry module touched down upright under windy conditions within the Inner Mongolia region, marking an end to the longest ever flight of a Chinese crew. Due to the lack of space in the developing station, China can't house multiple crews for a transition period like what happens on the ISS, so for the time being Tiangon will be abandoned, however the cargo resupply Tianzhou 4 mission should be launching in May, with the next crew flight Shenzhou 14 launching just a month later. The crew of Shenzhou 14 will also be welcoming two new laboratory modules to the station, Wenshin and Mongtian, which will allow more space for said crew transitions in the future. The final piece of traffic to cover is Neural 85, which launched atop Falcon 9 B1071 for its second flight at 1313 UTC from Slick 4E at Vandenberg Space Force Base in California, marking the first time the National Reconnaissance Office flew a payload on a flight proven booster. This first flight of this booster was for another NRO mission earlier in the year, also from Vandenberg. Due to the customer not wanting to share a lot of information about their secret payload, all we know is that it is going to a 1200 by 1024 kilometer 63.5 degree orbit and that's it 
B-171 successfully touched down at landing zone 4, previously Slick 4 West, marking the 40th consecutive landing of an orbital class rocket booster, which is a fantastic record to set. SpaceX is really making this whole reusability thing an everyday occurrence, but in my opinion, seeing another RTLS recovery keeps this special, as the vast majority of recoveries we see now do head out to the drone ship. Coming up this week we have Starlink 414, there and back again on a special Electron, Crew 4 on another Falcon 9 and an Angara 1.2 with MKAR. This girl's a fascination And nothing in her way Will keep her from her destination Cause she's fine And here's your space weather with Dr. Tamitha Scove. With nine M-class flares and one X-class flare, our sun is a big, bright ball of activity this week. As we take a look at the Earth-facing disk, we actually have four big flare players on the Earth-facing disk, region 2990, 91, 92, 93, and 94. They all have been rated as big flare players. Now, of course, all eyes are on the east limb where region 2993 and 94 are dominating the stage. Region 2994, shoots off a big X-class flare, wham, right there, when the region was hardly even in view yet. And we've had more M-class flares than we can shake a stick at, so this means radio blackouts have been on the menu. And as these regions continue to rotate into Earth view, we are going to get a bigger chance for radiation storms, more radio blackouts, and as of next week, solar storms that are Earth-directed. So it's going to be a very busy week in space weather, and you can actually see these regions and all the electrical activity as they begin to rotate across the disk. It's just a bunch of eye candy and it's going to affect space traffic, so we're going to have to keep on our toes. Now as we switch to our far-sighted view, this is Stereo A and it's looking at the sun just a little bit from the side. You can see in the east that big set of regions, 2993 and 2994, and just to the east of it, you also see what's going to be numbered region 2995. This is also playing a role in all these big flares, and as this region begins to rotate into Earth view, we're once again going to boost that solar flux up, and we're going to see whether or not this region is going to increase even more all of the solar flares and all of the potential solar storms that we're going to definitely see over this next week. For more details on this week's space weather, including how these big flare players might affect you, come check out my channel or see me at spaceweatherwoman.com. If you want to support the show financially as well as through subscriptions, then you can do so by becoming a YouTube member. The different citizen ranks get different perks such as access to Discord channels, space news scripts, and the ability to see the citizen exclusive pre and post show live broadcasts. To join the Escape Velocity Orbital Suborbital and Ground Support citizens, head to youtube.com slash tmro slash join or the join button below. As I mentioned earlier in the show, I'm running a GoFundMe campaign to head out to the Space Coast in August to cover Psyche, so if a monthly contribution isn't your thing, then consider heading over there. The link is in the description and at the end of the video. There are plenty of free ways to help us, and I know everybody says it, but if we ask you to subscribe to the channel and like the videos, it genuinely does boost the amount of people who do it, and with your support, the almighty algorithm will show our content to more people. For now though, thank you so much for your subscriptions, likes and watch time, and goodbye.